on the front end. And you ought to appreciate. That's why I love him so much, him and mom, because they didn't give up on me. See, you remember the potter and the clay? And, and, and the Bible says, you know, he told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. I'm going to teach you something. He gets down there. He sees the potter. He sees the clay. And the potter was working on it. And so uh, a symbolic representative uh, of God being the potter, the clay being us, right? And so when, when the potter looked down and saw that the clay was marred, it was messed up. Now, here's the deal. It couldn't have been the potter's fault because if God is the potter, he doesn't make mistakes. It must have been that the clay was not cooperating with the process. So when the, when the potter saw that the clay was marred, messed up, he smashed it. And the Bible says that he made it again. He said, no problem, I, you know, it's still there. Another vessel, as it was pleasing to the potter to make it. And, and so, so I like to say that even if I was the clay after being smashed, I may be damaged, but I'm still destined. Watch this. He may have messed up the clay, but he didn't throw it away. Somebody say, I'm still on the wheel. Watch out now. As long as I'm, I'm still on the wheel, the songwriter said, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. But when God is through, I, I shall come out as pure gold. Yesterday, I told you that I was going to try to do some teaching, not preaching. I'm not going to give you that today. I'm not going to make that statement, you know, because I know right now there was a shift last night, and I'm going to walk in that shift. Yesterday, I gave you a, a one thing, and, and today I thought I was going to do part two, say part two. part two. But last night, God said, no, 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 that whole part two, you can get rid of that. And so, so uh, uh, this morning, uh, we worked on something else. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, is really when the Lord told me that, I was like, man, that's awesome because I really don't have to do a whole lot of preparation for that. I walk this thing every day. Amen. So, so uh, what he said, I want you to talk to them about being a faithful man. A faithful man. Solomon, Solomon, he said, you know what? And we'll see it later in scripture. He said, Deborah, a faithful man, who can find? I mean, he was a leader. He was a king. He, he ran a nation. He had all kind of people in his face. He had all kind of people giving him empty words and flattery and et cetera, and people coming before him and going, and him giving assignments and everything, and he would have to delegate things because obviously he couldn't run a nation by himself. And so he would get frustrated with his leaders, and he said, you know what, man, a faithful man, who can find? I mean, this is, this is, this is like... Like one in a hundred, I've heard it said. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's a sad commentary. Uh, 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 you know, I, I was talking to Dad this morning. We, we both got a little emotional when we were talking about it. Uh, but when we were in the school, Faith Outreach Christian Life Center was over there in the school. Uh, um, uh, uh, he pulled up me and, and Brother Brian, Brother Morrison. Now Pastor Brian, Elder Morrison, myself. Uh, but we, they used to call us the three amigos. And so Dad called us up and uh, was talking about us in front of the congregation and, and this is what he said. And I, I, I never forget it. This is like 1997, maybe, six or seven. He said, what sets these three brothers apart is that they're faithful. Now, that sounds so simple. And, and it grieved me. Because at the time, I said, well, and, you know, I was so young, so I was like, uh, why should that even be something that's said. You know, I mean, everybody should be faithful, but I didn't know nothing. <laughs> I was new to church. I, I didn't know how church folk were. I didn't know. I didn't know that ch church folk would say, oh, yeah, I'll be there at 9, show up at 930. That church folk would say, yeah, I'll be there at Bible study. Don't come for two weeks. I, I didn't know. You know, so, so to me, I was like, why is that even a, a differentiation? That shouldn't be a big deal. You should just do what you say and say what you do. But I've learned now that, unfortunately, like Solomon said, who can find? And here's the deal. God needs someone that's faithful. And your pastor's. Need someone that's faithful. And 
I'm, I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to teach you, and then we're going to make an impartation. Um, this is what I, I'm going to just share with you four things that have really been a blessing uh, to me uh, that, that have helped develop me. And they're very simple. It's, it's two pairs. It's faith and patience, joy and peace. Faith and patience, I call them the power twins, joy and peace. That's another set of power twins. Uh, we talked about faith and patience a little bit last night. But if we can couple these four things, if we can get men and women in the church that, that operate in faith and patience and then joy and peace in believing, then we would, we would revolutionize the church. We would get folks saved. We, we would do everything on time. We would get th things done. We would be effective, efficient. Uh, our pastors wouldn't be stressed out. They wouldn't have to repeat things three and four and five and six times. They wouldn't have to stay up in the middle of the night trying to do something that somebody else said they were going to do, but they didn't do it. Now the pastor has to do it. If we would just be, have faith and patience, joy and peace in believing. So a faithful man is what I want to talk about today. I know we, when we read the word, we, we often miss things. Like Joseph. I talked about Joseph a little bit yesterday. We love Joseph. Awesome story, Paul. Awesome. I like it. You know, good story. Read. God had a dream. You know, he was 17, got the dream. We don't realize that, that it wasn't until he was 30 that he stood before the king. We don't realize. And then we say, oh, so, so there was 13 years between uh, the time the dream came and the manifestation of it. No, no. Your math is messed up. Because after he stood before the king, then there was seven years of plenty. Then seven years of famine. And it was somewhere in that seven years of famine that he stood above his brothers. So it was over 20 years between the dream and the manifestation of it. See, it's awesome to pray and to say like we said last night, I have it right now. Hallelujah. Right? But there's a space between I believe I receive and there it is. Oh, there's a space between the promise and the performance. There's a space between the confession and the completion. And in the space between the promise and the performance, the devil brings problems. In the space between the confession and the completion of it, the devil tries to stir up confusion. And so if you're not strong in the space, then you won't see the manifestation of it. Watch this. And it won't be God's fault. So, yeah, get excited. When, when you see the glimpse of it, get excited when you say, I have it now, and you call it by faith, and you call those things which be not as though they were, but just know that your prayer is also going to require practice. Your prayer is also going to require you to put some faith behind it. Because when you come out of your prayer closet, now it's time to work, baby. Say amen to that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Your lips have to line up with the word, but then your legs got to line up with the word too. So if you don't have any legs to your faith, you'll never see the manifestation of it. So yeah, I, I thank God for your lips, but we got to get some faith in our legs too. Amen? Amen. So, so yeah, what about Abraham? Oh, we talk about Abraham all the time. That's exciting. It's exciting to hear that Sarah was eavesdropping in the tent. And basically, God said in today's English, girl, you're still going to have that baby. That's exciting that after all these years, me being old, shall I have pleasure? After all these years, I'm going to still have that baby, that promised child. Are you going to resurrect dead dreams? That's exciting. But we forget there was 24 years in between. 25 years when you count the nine more months. So there was 25 years between the promise and the performance, I already talked about Caleb. He waited 45 years. We talked about Jesus yesterday who waited 30 years for a three and a half year ministry. What about Elijah? Elijah, God says, listen, uh, here's a word. Go tell the king because of what he's doing that it's not going to rain. He says, it's not going to rain until I say it rains. And, and then he leaves. I'm sure he didn't know it was going to be 40 months before rain came. I'm, I'm positive he didn't, he didn't know it was going to be 40 months, three and a half years 
Well, because here's the problem. By me cursing the land, now I don't get water either. So, yeah, he went to the brook, but the brook dried up. So now he has to deal with the declaration that he said. And so he's dealing with this thing for three and a half years, and there are death squads looking for him. You think we, you think we got people out there looking for Osama bin Laden? Read the Bible. King Ahab had people, he sent out search parties. He had people and he went and asked neighboring kings and said, listen, are you holding Elijah? And they said, no. He said, listen, if you're lying, then it's a declaration of war between my country and your country. That's how serious he was about killing Elijah. And Elijah was doing nothing but following God. And he had to stay out there on the run for three and a half years because he was serving God. Are you ready to serve a faithful man who can find? I'm not talking about being faithful for a few weeks. I didn't even have to say I'm not talking about being faithful on Sundays and Wednesdays. I mean, you know, that should go without saying. But I'm not talking about being faithful for, you know, oh, man, this conference was awesome. The next eight weeks, I'm on fire. I'm not even saying being faithful for a few months. Watch this. I'm not even saying, Brother Stokes, being faithful for a few years. Why? God has no retirement plan. So you might as well get over that. You know, I'm in the military. I've been in the military 19 and a half years. People say, oh, man, when you get now? Why? Because there's a span. And after a certain time, they go, okay, well, hey, you've done enough. You know, either you get tired of them or they get tired of you. But watch this. There's no retirement plan in God. So he's not looking for you to be faithful for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of years. No, that's not the issue. He wants to know, okay, yeah, you gave your life to me. You say I'm your Lord. Now get ready for the ride. Because it's for the rest of your life. While you're in the land of the living, if you're still breathing, if there's air still flowing through your lungs, if there's blood still flowing through your veins, then God is not through with you. If God was through, you would be gone. But since you're still here, then you still need to be working. Say working. I like when we quote, especially leaders, uh, study the word to show thyself. Approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's the problem. Workmen, you can't be a workman if you're not working. Remember that movie, Throw Mama from the Train? Billy Crystal was a writer. And so when he was standing at the, at the typewriter, they had typewriters back then. I don't know if y'all remember that. Typewriter, clink, clink, clink. So he stood at the typewriter, and, and he had writer's block. And so the way that he would try to get himself engaged, he would say, a writer writes, a writer writes, a writer writes. Well, guess what? A workman works. And if you're not working, you're not a workman. Somebody will get that later. So God didn't call you to sit. And watch this. You don't need a title to work. You don't need the pulpit to work. You don't need a, a preaching schedule to work. If God called you, then hey, he called you to do something. You need to get busy, and then your pastor will see you working. And instead of asking them for an opportunity, they'll give you opportunity because you're already doing it. Say amen to that. In the military, we promote based upon potential, but we promote because what we do is we promote an environment uh, to where we want people to already be operating at that level before we give them the rank. So if you want that rank, you start operating at that rank already. When I got, gave my life to Christ and I knew that I wanted to be a preacher, uh, what did I do? I hung around preachers. Now, I was from Brooklyn. I, didn't, I knew how to be a Brooklynite, but I didn't know how to be a preacher. So I hung around preachers. I wouldn't know what they was talking about. You know, when we go eat, they go eat. What they talking about when they eat? I know what I, I was talking about, you know. What they talk about? What they talk about when they around their wives or with their kids? How, how, how do they dress? How do they act outside of church? That's what I want to know. 
You know, I want to know all these things. Why? Because I wanted to be one of them. So I started acting like them, mimicking them, still my flavor, but I put myself in that environment. I deprogrammed so I could reprogram because I knew that it was going to take that type of investment if I was ever going to be there. Say amen to that. Amen. amen. We're talking about being a faithful man. So let me share with you a few characteristics of a faithful man, and then we're going to get into those four things I've talked about. Let's turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew and chapter 14. We're talking about uh, being in this thing for the long haul. Say long haul. Matthew and chapter 14, um, a faithful man. Now, Matthew 14, uh, it, it starts off with the beheading of John the Baptist. We talked about John the Baptist yesterday, Jesus' cousin. And so by this point, he was beheaded. And I like the fact that what Jesus did when the enemy finally struck the blow and killed his cousin, the way that he fought back was not earthly. So when he got upset because this is what happened to his cousin and he got news, that's what happened. You know what he did? He got up and he went out there and he healed everybody that was sick. He fought back against the forces of darkness, but he fought back on a spiritual level, not on a carnal level. Say amen to that. And so after that, you know, he fed the multitude with fishes and loaves. And after that long day of of everything that had gone on, he was physically drained, probably emotionally, psychologically drained. He told his, his disciples, man, y'all go ahead and get into the boat, and I'm going to catch up to you. Verse 23. Sister Deborah, are we there? Verse 23. Uh, read that, please. So he sent the multitudes away. And he was by himself praying. A faithful man understands the importance of prayer. A faithful man. If you want to be a faithful man, and when I say man, I don't mean just gender. I'm not talking about, so I'm talking male, female. But if you want to be a faithful man, then you have to develop your prayer life. You are not, kind of like uh, what Carol Jones said, a prayerless leader is a powerless leader, which will then be a pitiful leader, right? So if you are prayerless, you will be powerless. If you want to be a faithful man, right up front, I got to tell you, you got to develop your prayer life. If you're not praying, start praying now. Somebody say now. now. You have to develop your prayer life. Jesus, after everything that had transpired, he said, listen, I need some time by myself. Y'all go on ahead, and he went apart by himself to pray, to release, uh, to release and to receive from the Father. When you pray, you ought to release and you ought to receive. Say amen to that. Amen. So a faithful man understands the importance of prayer. Number two is a faithful man understands the importance of rest. Say rest. He sent everybody away. He went over there to pray, but I know that he was also resting. As a, as a believer, you are going to have to get some rest. Don't, don't, don't pack your schedule so tight that you're running from here and running to there and running from here and running to there and you don't have any time for your kids and you don't have any time for your wife and you don't have any time for yourself. You need some rest. So that you can be fresh and ready and restored and revived and rejuvenated so that you can do the work of the ministry. You can't do the work of the ministry if you're always tired. You can't serve your man of God, your woman of God, if when they're looking for you, you're yawning. You need to get some rest. Rest is spiritual. You have to schedule that thing. Jesus didn't have no problem with saying, hey, y'all go ahead. Y'all get out of here now. I need some time by myself. I mean, I love y'all and everything. You know, we, we together all the time, but, you know, not all the time. Come on now. I need some time by myself. You need some time to rest. Say rest. Yes. See, most people get burnt out in ministry because they just get tired. Amen. They just get tired. I mean, just straight up get tired. Tired of, tired of church. Why? Because they're just so ripping and running to where they, they don't even have uh, enough strength or energy uh, to really hear what the man of God is saying. So you could be in church and not even be in church. Be so tired to where you're sitting here and not receiving nothing, and then you just get burnt out. You need to have some time to get refreshed and restored and revived. That's why if you're married, playing cowboys and Indians is important. 
Say amen to that. And if you're not, just hold on. Somebody say, hold on. Number three, a faithful man. Read verses 24 and 25, Deborah. Can we get another mic, please? But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, from the wind with, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, I already told you about this whole thing yesterday, the fourth watch of the night. Let me just bring this up. As a faithful man, you ought not to be surprised when storms come. So a faithful man expects opposition because remember, we learned yesterday that if you're doing something for the kingdom, there will be a target on your back. So if there's a target on your back, you expect opposition. So that's not a big deal. A faithful man is not surprised. It's not, woe is me. Why did this happen to me, pastor? No, it's the devil is a liar. And this is not going to rule over me. Matter of fact, yet this is just another opportunity for God to show up and show out. Watch this. If it's true, and it is, that God will not permit us to deal with something that's too great for us to handle, then if it's I'm handling it, if I'm facing it, then it's an indication that the Father trusts me with it. So if it's a big storm, then I say, man, Daddy, I done graduated. Instead of getting frustrated about it, I get excited and say, look at what daddy trusts me with now. There was a time in my life where I couldn't even deal with a puddle, but I'm over here dealing with this lake. So if it's a big challenge, then get excited about it because that means that daddy trusts you with He's not going to let you deal with something you can't handle. So if I'm handling it, then doggone it, I can take it. Because I'm a faithful man. Say amen to that. So a faithful man is not surprised when storms come. Verses 26 and 27. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Remember when Carol Jones said, If you mess up, then quickly repent. If, if, you, if you sense fear, you better deal with that thing right away. If you're going to be a faithful man, you have to develop the ability to resist fear. You cannot be in fear and in faith at the same time. If you sense you're getting afraid, stop it right then and there. I mean, take control of that thing. You can take authority over that thing. Speak the word. Speak life. Jesus, as soon as he sensed that they have fear, he said, hold on, stop. Fear not. Be not afraid. It is I. If he, if he said, be not afraid, then that means that they had the ability to do it. They could be afraid or they could be in faith. It's up to you. Somebody say, faith, faith is a choice. Just like fear is a choice. So you have to choose to be afraid, just like you have to choose to be in faith. And if you're going to be a faithful man, don't allow fear to be your choice. Say amen to that. Amen. All right, then here's the next one, verses 28 and 29. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. A faithful man is able to step out with a tailor-made word from God. Peter asked for a word. He got the word. He walked on the word. If you're going to be faithful, you have to have the ability to have a relationship with God to where you ask him for a word. Daddy, I'm a word man. I'm a word woman. You know the deal. If I'm going to be able to deal with this, I'm going to need a word. Amen. What's the word? And when you get the word, you step out on that word. And watch it. When you get the word directly, you can step out on that word and you don't need to question this thing or you don't need to go get confirmation for 27 people. But Peter didn't say, hey, uh, hey, guys, uh, did he really say that? No, they didn't ask for the word. Peter asked for the word because watch this. I'm convinced that if he would have asked them, they would have said, boy, you better not get out that boat. <laughs> they don't have the faith to get out the boat. 
there was only one joker crazy enough to ask for the word in the first place. And one joker got out the boat. So don't, if, if, if you're going to operate in this kind of faith, if you're going to cross the faith line, you just can't go ask everybody. You got you to gotta be, be selective in who you discuss things with. And you got to step out in your tailor-made word. Now, here's the thing. You got to step out on the word that's yours. Here's another thing I'm convinced, that if any one of the other disciples would have went out there, they would have just went straight in the water. Because that word was not for them. That word was for Peter. You need to know the word that you heard. That's why as a leader, you got to be able to, to hear from God for yourself. You don't need to have to call your pastor for everything. Call your pastor, dad, dad, uh, uh, mom, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I, I, uh, can you pray with me about this? What's the matter? I got a headache. A headache? Girl, you better get some more. You got to learn to hear from God for yourself. Say amen to that. Amen. Verses 30 and 31. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, Peter was walking on the word. And he saw the wind, boisterous, and the Bible says that he was afraid. Somebody say fear. fear. All right, keep reading. He was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, at least he had enough sense to say, save me. But he was afraid, beginning to sink, he said, Lord, save me. Keep and, reading. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, and caught him. All right. And, and, and Jesus said. And said unto okay, him. Okay, now hold on. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, man, Peter, you are the only guy other than me to ever walk on water. Jesus said, man, Peter, high five, you, high five me. You know what I'm saying? You just walked on water. You just did something that nobody else ever did. And you, you're doing something that probably nobody else will ever do. You will go down in history as the second man to walk on water. Peter, you the man. No, he didn't say that? Oh, no? He didn't get excited? He didn't thank him? Jesus didn't do a backflip? What did Jesus say? Oh, thou of little faith. Oh, Jesus. Can you have some mercy on a brother? Can you at least give me some dap? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I done did something that nobody else did. And come on, pastor. You know what I'm saying? No, no. He said, no, ye of little faith. Now, watch it. It couldn't have been type. Little there is not a reference to type. Because type was off the chain. He walked on water. That was awesome faith. No, it was a reference to duration. It was a short burst of faith. And what Jesus was saying is that, listen, I don't get excited about that. Anybody can have a short burst of faith. Anybody can get excited at a conference and be on fire for two weeks. whoop de doo Get over that. Jesus said, you ain't impressing me with that. You want to impress me? Show up every day. You want to impress me? Get before my face seven days a week. People that, 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 that uh, chase after miracles, these are people that just want to see the miraculous. They go over here, they go over there because they're searching for that. No, no. You want to see a miracle? Walk, walk by faith every day. That's what pleases God. Chase him. Jesus was saying, I'm not impressed with you walking on water because you only did it for a few steps. And, and, and pastors get frustrated when they see you do something awesome for a couple of weeks. And then, they, you know, they go home and they say, baby, did you see, did you see Brother Bubble come today? My God. The hand of God is on them. Sister Cucumber's on fire. <laughs> they're in the bed talking about you, and they're just so excited. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to put her, yeah, yeah, I've been praying about it. She's on fire. I think I'm going to put her over the women. And then two weeks later, you know where to be found. <laughs> Somebody say short burst. short burst. Anybody can have a short burst of faith. No, no, no. You want to be faithful? You want to be a faithful leader? Show up every day. 
You, oh, you be there for your man of God. You be there for your woman of God. You be there for God, first of all. And you just don't fail. And if you're consistent with that thing, then eventually your gift will make room for you. Say amen to that. Amen, amen. amen. So that was, that was just a few characteristics of a, a faithful man. Now, let's, let's get into this faith and patience, the power twins. Somebody say power twins. Power twins. Now, now we, we dealt with Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12 last night. That was all in my stuff, so, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, I was going to deal with verses 10, 11, 12, but he already dealt with that last night. So, so uh, but really what, what he was dealing with, bottom line is just this, is that through faith and patience, those that have gone before us, they obtain the promises of God. How do we obtain it? It's through faith and patience. Somebody say both. Here's the thing about both being required. But because without faith, we know it's impossible to please God. Without faith, I don't have the power to affect change in my situation. So when I operate in faith, I can actually speak to situations, speak to mountains, lay hands on the sick, watch them recover, cast out devils and demons. Without faith, I don't have power, right? right. But without patience, I don't have endurance. And so if, if I have faith with no patience, I'm going to be short burst. But if I have patience with no faith, I'm just going to suffer all the time. Because the person with patience, he can hold on. She can hold on. Hold to God's unchanging hand. I said, hold to his hand. And see, but the thing is, they told you to hold, but they didn't tell you what to do. How long? What you going to do to get out? While I'm holding, am I ever going to be able to break free? So I suffer. But I can never change my situation. So one person is, is over here, extreme faith, faith, hallelujah, faith, confessing, speaking from the time they get up, all kind of speaking this, speaking that. The devil is a lie. You can't even buy some gum in Walmart without a hallelujah. <laughs> then over here, other extreme, you got over here trouble in my way. Got to cry sometime. Lay awake all night. That's all right. Jesus is going to fix it. After a while, oh, Lord. <laughs> and so I'm over here waiting, but I don't have any power to change anything. So I'm just waiting on God, and God is waiting on me. <laughs> and since he's waiting on me, I'm waiting on him. We're going to be there a long time. Somebody say long time. long time. So if I have faith, no patience, I'm short burst. If I have patience, no faith, I'm Mr. Suffering all the time. Amen. But, oh, whoa, whoa, watch it. What if, what if I have both? What if I have the power to change my situation and the patience to hold on till I see it manifested? What if, what if I can remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For I know that my labor is not in vain in the Lord while I wait in the space between the promise and the performance, in the space between the confession and the completion. What if I'm faithful? Then I'm going to see my breakthrough. Let's, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look. Faith and patience. Somebody say power twins. We already know, I, I shouldn't have to teach you about faith. Faith is an expression of your confidence in God and his word. We know that. I shouldn't have to teach you about that. But a lot of people don't understand patience. So let's talk about patience. Patience is not just simply waiting. Somebody say waiting. waiting. Now, mom talked about this uh, Greek word this morning, uh, patience. She actually said endurance, and it's actually translated both, endurance and patience. But it's a Greek word, hupomone. Hupomone uh, is, is really meaning the force of consistency. Uh, uh, or another translation that I use is the ability to remain the same internally in spite of circumstances externally. In other words, no matter what my external looks like, I'm not going to allow my internal to change. And so if, if I can do that, then I have biblical patience. Somebody say patience. I have hupomone operating in my life when I'm, I'm able to remain the same no matter what the circumstances look like. Amen. Amen. So I have the force of consistency operating in my life. So it's not that just that I'm, I'm just waiting. No, I'm remaining consistent while I'm waiting. 
And since I have faith, then, then every morning I get up expecting that, guess what, today might be the day. So I'm believing God for something, and then I, I get up, and I pray, and, and, and sometimes I'll say something like this, and I, I say this. I say, Dad, I don't know. Today might be the day. If you want to give it to me today, that's cool with me. You know what I'm saying? So as I go, if you want to bless me with it today, I'm cool with that. And if not, I'm going to still hold on. It's faith and patience because I need them both to obtain the promises of God. Um, here's a key scripture. Let's go to Galatians 6 and 9. Deborah, in your notes, I, I have it in the NIV. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Um, I want to read this from the NIV. You know the King James. The King James says, be ye not weary in well-doing. For in what? You shall what? If what? See, y'all know the scripture, <laughs> but let, let's, let's see what it means. Read it. Let us not become weary in doing good. Now, first of all, you are here. Somebody said that's doing good. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. You, being here, you being here is well doing. Is well doing. So right, up the, right off the bat, I just want you to know that I'm glad that you're here. Your pastors are glad that you're here. God is glad that you're here. This is well doing. Here's the problem. Don't grow weary in well doing. Keep reading. For at the proper time. Oh, at the proper time. So you're telling me that there's an appointed time for things to happen. Yes. And oftentimes, God's timing and our timing are not the same timing. And so when God's clock and my clock don't line up, I'm either going to get frustrated or excited. Amen. I can get frustrated or I can get excited to say, well, it's not time yet, but it's going to come. Amen. Amen. Keep reading. For at the proper time, we will read. Now, wait. At the proper time, we will read. King James says, we shall read, right? What's the next word? A harvest if we do not give up. If is conditional. So it says, we shall reap a harvest if we don't give up. So what happens if we give up? Whose fault is it? Not God's. So you telling me that I can be holding on and holding on and then give up and not reap it because it was my fault. I cannot reap it because I gave up. Okay, let me just ask you this so you can answer that. In, in the garden... God blessed Adam and Eve. We know that, right? In the image of God created, he, him, male and female created, he, them. He gave them dominion over the fish of the sea, follow the air, beasts of the field, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. He gave them dominion, power, authority. And then he gave them in chapter 2, you, he, they, had, they had power, they had uh, uh, partnership, uh, they, they had uh, all, everything that they needed was functioning in their life. Chapter 3, they lost it all. Did God want them to lose it? Whose fault was it? They chose. Did God knock the apple out of the hand or whatever it was? No. If you give up, you give up. Everything is not God's will. Everything is not God. Some things are you. And we got to stop blaming God for everything and take accountability of our actions. Amen? Amen. And so if things are not... Functioning, it may be because we're giving up too early. People say, oh, man, Brother Pena, I tried that faith thing. That don't work. No, faith tried you. And you didn't work. <laughs> say amen to that. Amen. All right, all right. I mean, it's in the word. I mean, faith has to work. But you can't give up. If you give up, you won't reap it. James 5 and 10 Bishop had me to read this this morning, but I got to read it again because it's just, it's just so good. 5 and 10, uh, 10, 11 from the Message Bible, uh, Deborah. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit. See, the thing about this is that I know, I know, and I believe in prosperity, and I believe that, that God has called us to, to be blessed, head not the tail, above only not beneath, winner not the loser, victor not the victim. Got it. But that doesn't mean, like I said yesterday, that I'm not going to face nothing. He said, listen, take the prophets of old, 
they went through everything, put up with all this stuff, but they never once quit. They kept on going. I told you yesterday, the only way you can lose is if you quit. The devil wants to get you to throw in the towel because he knows that if he can get you to throw in the towel, you won't reap and it'll be your fault. But if you refuse to throw in the towel and you say, come hell or high water, come what may, from day to day, I'm going to continue to go forward, then he can't stop you. And guess what? When you finally get your breakthrough, you will have a bigger crown when you get there. It'll be a bigger harvest because of what you went through. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. Keep reading. And never once quit all the time honoring God. All the time continuing to honor God, read. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. Every day. If, if you just determine in your heart, in your mind, I'm going to serve God no matter what happens, then life is awesome. Life is a gift. This Christian walk is, is, a, is, a, is a ride. Yes, God wants you to make it to heaven, but he also wants you to enjoy the ride. God doesn't want you to be saved and miserably saved. I've met a lot of folks that are miserably saved. Broke, busted, and disgusted. Frustrated, disillusioned, and hard to get along with. But saved. No. If you are consistent, then no matter what you face, I'm talking about what a gift life is to those who stay the course. To those who just determine that, you know what, I'm going to walk this thing out. I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. And no matter what, and then the thing about that is, is if you are really determined to walk this thing out, then your countenance, because of patience, because of hoopomone, then you will have a smile on your face, a spring in your step, and a song in your heart, and you will whistle while you work, even though you're dealing with all kind of challenges. And people won't even know you're going through I remember when Isabella had the uh, miscarriage and, and, and uh, I came and she hadn't come to church for a while because obviously she had the miscarriage. And so, so I came and when people finally found out, they go, oh, I didn't know. Brother Pena, I couldn't tell. Well, you ain't going to tell by me. Because, yeah, yeah, he struck me a blow. Did I cry? Yeah, I cried for a little while. Then I wiped them tears up and said, no, baby, we got to keep going. Then I got a revelation, and then God gave me a word, and God said, make him another body. And then five weeks later, we came together, got Joshua another body. <laughs> Joshua's running around now. Yeah, I could have allowed that to destroy me, but I said, no, 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 no. Every day I got up and continued to serve. Why? Because what a gift life is to those who stay the course. Just steady. Just steady. You don't have to be all supernatural. Just steady. You don't got to be one of those persons that always got a word. Just steady. You know, one of those people you can't even talk to at the commissary because if you see them going, oh, no, hey, they always got a word. Always got a word. Hey, what you doing? Looking for some spaghetti. You know what the Lord has said about spaghetti? No. Not interested. Somebody say, just steady. A faithful man who can find God is just looking. Your pastor is just looking for someone that's just going to be steady. A brother, sister that I can call no matter what. Not going to hear a whole lot of murmuring. Not going to hear no complaining. I can call him. Get this done. Guess what? Watch this. Won't hear nobody else talking about it. Word won't get around, girl. Pastor, call me 2 o'clock in the morning. Nope. Just steady. Not making a whole lot of noise, just steady. And that's all we need. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. All right, have y'all speaking that by faith. All right. <laughs> you know, when I left Faith Outreach, I left Faith Outreach in 1997, and um, I went to Texas. And so Brother Morrison uh, was here, obviously, you know, the three amigos. So, so we prayed, and uh, uh, that's one thing I thank God that whenever I PCS, the Lord has always told me, what my church was going to be before I got there. So I've never been one of those people where you get there and be like, oh, I'm just looking for a church for three months, six months, none of that. So, so I knew what church I was going to. Brother Morrison had an uncle that was a pastor in Copper's Grove, Texas, Thomas Chapel, Thomas Chapel AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church. 
in hindsight, I probably should have prayed more. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I went there. And so I connected with, with his uncle, Pastor Carl Estes Garment Sr., mighty man of God. And, and Uncle Carl, Pastor Carl, had a great ministry. They had about, maybe about 40 members. And I started working with them, supporting them, helping them out. Hey, Pastor, anything you need? One thing led to another. Guess what? Within a year, we were up to about 130 members. And, and uh, he had a lunchtime Bible study going on. I was a W1, had a lunchtime Bible study. I was driving out there every day. Well, before you know it, he gave me the Bible study. I wasn't a minister yet, hadn't accepted my call. I'm teaching Bible study five days a week, Monday through Friday for lunch, teaching Sunday school. So I'm teaching six lessons a week. Sometimes I was teaching Wednesday night, and I'm not even a minister, and I'm real busy, and, and I get excited, and the Bible study at lunchtime grew. And we started off with about 12. It went all the way up to 42 people. Man, I'm talking about, I was, man, I was on cloud nine. Every day, getting a word. I had just started today's word. So I'll send out today's word in the morning, prepare Bible study for lunch, and I was still trying to work. And then I was going out there, and then 40-something people at lunch, Bible study every day. It was awesome. Somebody say awesome. awesome. In the AME church, they got this thing, oh, <laughs> to where every year, the bishops could just move pastors around. And the bishop got the report from our church, everything we were doing. He said, man, you're doing a great job. So there's a church in Corpus Christi there. I got about 300 members. Their pastor just died. Uh, pastor Garman, I'm going to move you over there. And they gave me a new guy. And there came a pharaoh that knew not Joseph. <laughs> and so this guy comes in. I'm not going to say his name. He comes in. Been pastoring for 20 years, never had more than 30 members. I should have knew something right there. So we start serving the guy, hey, hey, this is what we do. This is how we do it. Oh, okay. He never came out to the Bible study, never supported this, never supported that. Everybody before was on time for everything because uh, Pastor Carl was on time. This guy was late for everything, so people started coming late for this, coming late for that. So before you know it, people started coming to this, coming to that. Long story short, I remember when the 42 went down to 30, 30 down to 20, 20 down to 10, 10 down to 2, 3. And I remember that fateful day when I drove out to Copper's Cove, Texas. Opened, because I had my own key, opened the church, went in, prayed, had my lesson, had the podium. Waited for the people. And no one showed up. And I started weeping. And I said, God, how could you let this happen? 